Welcome back to The Roots of Violence, our series of interviews in which we're attempting to look at the current situation in the Middle East and trying to understand where the physical violence has come from. We're trying to understand what has led to the wars and violence, which is apparently so endemic across the region. Presenza readers know that physical violence is the last resort of the hopeless who have been on the receiving end of all manner of economic and psychological violence beforehand. Therefore, if we can see what the causes of the physical violence are, maybe there's a chance to treat them in their roots and find a non-violent solution. We're back again with Emad Kiai, Director of the Middle East Treaty Organization. And before I start throwing more questions at him, I'm going to give a short summary of what we've heard in the last interview. So in 1952, Iran elects a government which tries to implement a plan to nationalize the oil industry so that the oil profits can go to benefit ordinary Iranian people and not the oil companies. The CIA from the United States and Britain's MI6 collaborate to overthrow this government and install their puppet king, the Shah of Iran. The Shah remains in power for 25 years, during which time he violently crushes all opposition, leaving the people hopeless. Nevertheless, the opposition doesn't disappear. Marxists, Islamists, academics, students, and the oppressed of all kinds wait for their moment. By 1978, the situation is getting dire and protesters take to the streets. And in Tehran on the 8th of September, 1978, a day that goes down in history as Black Friday, the military opened fire on a protesting crowd, killing over 100 people. This sets off a chain of events that leads very quickly to the Shah getting on a plane in January 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini returns home and the Islamic Republic is born. When students break into the US Embassy in Tehran and discover papers indicating that the USA is planning another coup, things get nasty and there is a standoff in which 52 US diplomats and nationals are held hostage for 444 days. Relations between Tehran and Washington never recover from these events, and Iraq is encouraged and financed to start a war against its neighbor, which lasts for eight years and results in the deaths and injuring of hundreds of thousands of people. In that war, Iraq uses chemical weapons on its neighbor and its own internal opposition. And then in another unexpected turn in history, Saddam Hussein decides to invade Kuwait, its former province. The West's favorite bogeyman passes from Iran to Iraq and the first Gulf War starts to unfold. Iran tries to take advantage of the situation to breathe and rebuild as a nation. So Emad, I hope I've given a more or less acceptable summary there. Um, in the late 1990s, we, we start to hear more and more about a non-state actor called Al-Qaeda. Um, but, so before we go back to, to Iran, can you tell us a little bit about the situation in the region that leads up to September the 11th, 2001? Thank you, Tony, for that summary. Uh, spot on. Uh, nothing else for me to add. But here uh, we are moving now to, the, as you said, the non-state actors and specifically Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda's roots um, originate actually in the fight against communism and the invasion of the Soviet Union of Afghanistan, uh, which again borders Iran. And in that conflict between Afghanistan um, uh, opposition against the invasion of the Soviet Union, um, again, ironically, the group that then became Al Qaeda was financed, trained, and propped up by the United States as they saw the fight against the communists. Soviet Union as part of their um, grand uh, Cold War uh, um, um, animosity between the two countries. So actually, if we again go back to the leader of Al-Qaeda, bin Laden, and his involvement, uh, uh, who's a Saudi national, uh, in terms of um, uh, its opposition against originally known as the Mujahideen against the uh, Soviet Union, we see again the finger of the United States government in, in, in this conflict um, and how the turn of events um, uh, happen in the late 1990s and we start to hear about Al-Qaeda is first through the bombings of US embassies in East Africa and, and so we first of all came out from that um, events and the 
tide of change where bin Laden becomes uh, opposed to US uh, involvement in the Middle East and specifically the going back to the first Gulf War of 1991 and the subsequent uh, um, involvement of the US ever more in the region for the first time you have US troops uh, on uh, uh, what bin Laden would call the holy lands of Islam, Saudi Arabia. And this is the first time that the U.S. expands enormously its foothold, its military foothold across the region in building up its military bases. So um, the Al-Qaeda phenomena that becomes then the perpetrators of 9-11 have their roots and justification for that use of violence against the United States based on three key reasons. One, the U.S. hegemonic ambitions in the Middle East in supporting dictatorships and despotic regimes that was uh, becoming increasingly um, uh, pitted against, you know, Islam against the West. This sort of this uh, um, uh, this uh, war between the civilizations, in a sense, the clash of civilizations. Um, number two, it is the fact that the U.S. involvement in the Middle East expands to include thousands upon thousands of military forces who are now stationed on Islamic land, on Muslim countries' land, specifically in Saudi Arabia. And number three, it was also as a result of the carnage and the support that the United States provided in the killing and the uh, advancement or the prolonging of wars that were happening in the region by backing one part to another to shed more blood that at the end was seen as the blood of the Muslims. Uh, so the the Al Qaeda uh, rise uh, was on the back of anti-Americanism and this uh, notion that the United States is actually um, uh, conducting a crusade in the region against the Islamic world. Um, to point out here again that Osama bin Laden, the mastermind of the 9/11 attacks, was a Saudi national when uh, it was uh, when uh, al-qaeda had its safe haven in afghanistan under the umbrella and protection of the taliban which was the afghan rulers then uh, who were quite far right in the spectrum of the islamic beliefs um, and uh, uh, ruled with the clan uh, clad over afghanistan were only supported and recognized by three countries I'm saying this because Al-Qaeda did not operate in a vacuum. It operated in a country and under an authority that allowed it to flourish, and that being the Taliban regime of Afghanistan. And that Taliban regime was recognized by the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and I'm forgetting one more country, Pakistan. These are the three countries that recognize Taliban. And by extension, these three countries also supported directly and indirectly, the Al-Qaeda's rise and its ability to have these operations uh, materialize that ultimately leads to the attacks on U.S. soil. Okay, so um, so tell me a little bit more about, about Al-Qaeda, because it seems that in, in one moment, these, um, these this group is fighting against against the communists and then again and then the americans start to develop a a, a big presence there and then they start um fighting against uh, uh against the americans and we have three countries that are supporting them saudi arabia united arab emirates uh, and and pakistan um what what's the role that saudi arabia is playing in all of this okay so any, any non-state actor um, is able to propagate, uh, proliferate its ideas, its ideologies, um, principally by five major factors. I'm saying this and I'll come back to Saudi Arabia in a minute. Number one, there needs to be an ideological underpinning. What is the thinking the, the, of these group? Uh -huh. uh, so what is the ideological underpinning? In many cases, those ideologies are uh, more cemented through their religious affiliation or religious beliefs. And we'll touch on that in a second. Number two, it's a re uh, financial requirement. Am I right? It needs funding. It needs money. It needs to be able to 
pay people, to recruit people. That goes to our third component, which is human resources. It actually needs people to believe in this ideology and to be able to hear the message and then follow the cause, whatever the cause may be. Number four, it needs to have a leadership or a structure that dictates the, the, uh, the direction of this organization or this entity of being a non-state actor or otherwise. Where is it going and who is its leader? And number five, it needs key backers. It needs nation states or very um, influential entities to provide it the backing it needs to be able to carry on. And when it comes under strain from opposition or from their enemy, it can withstand this pressure. So let's take these uh, uh, five pillars, let's say, for a non-state actor to operate and let's put the example of Al-Qaeda and say, okay, where is the ideological underpinning for Al-Qaeda? Well, in this case, is Saudi Arabia's ruling uh, uh, government's ideology based on a narrow interpretation of Islam that is the far right fringes of Islam, which is known as the followers of Al-Wahhab. I'm not going to go into the history of Al-Wahhab. It suffice to say that they are in the literal uh, interpretation of Islam. They take it word by word. And they believe that, um, that this is the most pure form of Islam that they are um, living by. But, of course, it's very narrow. It's very extreme to the point that uh, the followers of Wahhabism or Salafism uh, are a minority within the Islamic world. But Amongst them, uh, key wealthy uh, Persian Gulf countries such as Saudi Arabia uh, are its main uh, supporters. So Al-Qaeda's ideological underpinning is based on a narrow perspective in interpretation of Islam known as the followers of Al-Wahhab. Number two, financing. How do they get the financing to be able to do what they do? Here, they get their financing overwhelmingly, again, from wealthy uh, Persian Gulf uh, Arab countries, specifically, again, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and to some extent, the Qataris that came later on. But this is where they got their money. Number three, uh, their human resources. Because they were able to propagate this um, fight between um, uh, Islam and the West, they recruited Islamists or those who were uh, trying to, they were seeing in front of their eyes in news the uh, continuous wars that have been waged in the Middle East and the increasing presence of the United States. When I say increasing presence, the, uh, the first Gulf War of 1991 had up to 550,000 US troops at one point stationed in Saudi Arabia, the holiest land for Islam. So you can easily then buy. Uh, having these images in, in, uh, uh, plastered all over the news, you can recruit those who believe that this is a war against Islam. So Al-Qaeda recruited across the world uh, in, uh, in its cause against the United States. Can Number I ask four, a question? Yeah. Can I ask yes, a question? Go ahead. Because, because if, um, if uh, this... The support, a lot of support is coming from Saudi Arabia. It is the government of Saudi Arabia that has invited the United States in to set up all their bases. How do, how do, how do those two pieces of information fit together? So uh, this, this is a little bit more complicated. It's not that the, uh, the Saudi government, um, uh, you know, brought a direct transfer of money to Al-Qaeda's uh, coffers. No. It had a labyrinth of other uh, mechanisms to be able to support Al-Qaeda and its operations. And when I say Saudi Arabia was one of the only countries to recognize the Taliban regime of Afghanistan, that was its one uh, pathway to support Al-Qaeda's operations. Because Saudi Arabia, on one, on one place, the government at that time was making sure that Saddam does not, is not victorious in Kuwait because... Don't forget, uh, Kuwait borders Saudi Arabia. And so um, uh, for Saudi Arabia, national security, they saw the invasion of Saddam Hussein of Kuwait as a direct threat to their own national security. 
and here they brought the U.S. to protect its uh, resources. Um, but on the other hand, this ideological war that has been fought out, that is now uh, we're talking about Al-Qaeda propagating, falls within the domain of the regional conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran, that is now we're here talking about a little bit more about the sectarian nature of these regional wars that are happening where you are have one group of Islamic thoughts, the Shia versus the Sunni uh, um, uh, theological sort of uh, uh, division in Islam. And here Al-Qaeda is seen as one arm of the Saudi uh, expansion of its ideology, which is based on Wahhabism and on Salafi uh, theology. So, so can, I, have an, you, I have another you, question here then. But I was going to say that it's not mutually exclusive. A government like Saudi Arabia can invite the U.S. to protect it, and at the same time, for its other purposes, for its other uh, uh, endeavors, support Al Qaeda and other uh, non-state actors, including Taliban, in pushing its own agenda on a regional level. So very often we we hear that conflict is caused by religious differences and frequently when you actually dig a little bit deeper into that story you discover that actually it's not about that at all it's about it's about the control of, of resources um are we talking when we talk here about you know the, this this uh, wahhabist strain of uh of the islamic religion um are we are we really saying that that this is this is a branch of a religion which is openly promoting war and violence because that's normally not what religions are about so is is religion here just being used as a as a front as a as a a, a pretext for a for a conflict or or is it just the age old um source of uh war and violence which is just control of resources uh, Tony, I'm not a theologian, so I'm not going to uh, claim that I fully understand all of the perspectives and the notions within any religion. What I do know is that religion is a powerful uh, underpinning that can be used to advance political, social, and economic aims of whoever is using religion as the backdrop. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it is, let's say, um, quite uh, plausible that in the calculations of Saudi Arabia and those who want to promote a specific strand of Islam, that they see themselves as by promoting this, as then putting the fault lines uh, on a different dimension where it's not economic, social, and regional domination or uh, advantage advantages, but rather, how do we take the Islamic world and turn them against my adversary? In this case, Al-Qaeda used it against the Americans, but also Al-Qaeda used it against the Shia of Iran. So um, here I wanted to make that a point that um, uh, when we go back again to the Iranian uh, revolution of 79 that created this earthquake in the region, one of the reasons why Saudi Arabia since late or early 80s, early 80s started to promote this strand of Islam, Wahhabism and Salafism across the world was to, in direct response to the revolution in Iran because they saw a political Islam taking hold in Iran and being able to become popular as a direct threat to their authority over the Islamic world. So they see religion as quite important. And they see the role of religion as one that can be sort of the lowest hanging fruit to get to the hearts and minds of the Muslims across the world. And it does work. And it has worked across the ages, may that be in Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, whatever you want to bring it on. Religion has always had that impact of hitting deep within the, the consciousness of any human being, may that be for good or may, not, may that be for alter reasons, in this case, unfortunately, for promoting violence against the other. Sure. 
So, um, so you've gone through the, these five points, the ideology, the funding, the human resources, the, the leadership. leadership and in the backing. Mm -hmm. And here, so we, leadership we know. In this case, Al-Qaeda's leadership was bin Laden, uh, you know, his, his uh, sermons, his speeches uh, uh, fired up a lot of people who saw, unfortunately, rightly, that the U.S. is meddling in, in the affairs of the Islamic world and is at the forefront of all the wars. This is 1991. U.S. has already been involved in the Middle East for, uh, for a long time. And it seems that every time the U.S. is involved, it has, is playing its own chess game of domination, extraction, exploitation, and by extension, uh, the ignition and the sustenance of wars. So uh, I don't want to justify what Al-Qaeda is doing, but I'm saying to understand why Al-Qaeda was able to recruit, was able to do what it did, is rooted in the fact that there's a lot of violence that was being um, perpetrated at the hands of the world powers, may that be the Soviets in Afghanistan or the US across the region. And that uh, from an ordinary Muslim sitting, let's say, in Indonesia or in Iraq or in the rest of the world. They're like, this Al-Qaeda guy has a point. Mm -hmm. We've got to fight back. This is a jihad. This is a holy war against the imposition of um, what they would say the unbelievers in the Middle East. The fight against the Soviet Union was primarily underpinned by the fact that the Mujahideen or the origins of Al Qaeda were fighting a godless empire, the Soviet Union. So mm -hmm. uh, religion plays a part. The belief so, in in this type of uh, uh, um, you know endeavors is powerful. So I have I have another question here. Um, what I mean back at, at the nineties. Uh, well, let's say from the 80s and the 90s. How are the living conditions for people who live in the Middle East? Because it's clear that the region has got a lot of wealth. There's a lot of there's a lot of oil. You know, oil, um, oil prices are generally uh, creating a lot of wealth in, in those countries that, that have oil. Um, but on the other hand, people who are well off, people who have access to healthcare and education and social security. These are not people who are generally rushing to the army to sign up so that they can that they can uh, participate in wars. So, w what is the social uh, conditions for people in the region um, which allow them to to consider that going to war is a, is a hopeful thing? Tony, uh, the wealth, the petrodollars that I have. Um, poured into the Middle East, and specifically these oil-rich countries, have been both a blessing and a curse. A blessing in terms that there is the resources, human resources, natural resources, the capital, to be able to have a region that is flourishing in every uh, domain of uh, human development. Unfortunately, there is a, a bigger game at play here. And one that has begun a long time ago, again, unfortunately, when we talk about Middle East, is, is uh, difficult to escape history. But the role of powers, colonial powers, may that be the French, the British, uh, to some extent even the Italians, to the role of the post-Second World War sole superpower, the United States, in securing the black gold, the, the oil that the global economy ran on and was um, being pumped out of the Middle East, uh, came at a cost. Uh, it came at a cost that the uh, United States and these world powers had traditionally and historically been able to control the uh, societies where this oil is being pumped out through uh, client states. So by uh, by a grand bargain, let's say, an easy way to put it. I am United States. I will provide you security. I will provide you backing. I will make sure you can continue governing over your people. But just sign over here. 
And that signature allows us to exploit your resources and we won't ask questions about your human rights record. We won't ask you what's happening internally. We will even support you. We will even train your police force, your intelligence services on how to suppress and oppress uh, these uh, uh, openings of political thought in your countries. This is unfortunately the bargain that has been signed by the leaders of the Middle Eastern countries. That if you want to maintain your power, over your population, make a deal with a much greater power in the world. In this case, the alliances that were formed in the Middle East from the end of the Second World War until 1991, uh, until the collapse of the Soviet Union, carved up the Middle East into those who were allied with the communist Soviet Union, with those who were allied with the United States, and then you have this anomaly called Iran that in 1979 revolution decided we don't want to go either east, we don't want to go west. We want to be an independent state, an independent state in an oil-rich region, in the cross crossroads of civilization and continents. Independence in this region is a direct threat to the national security of global powers. They, that is why for millennia, every power, may that be the Romans, the Greeks, the Chinese, the Indians, the Persians, the Arabs, and everybody in between that has come through this region is to dominate the Middle East, you dominate the world politics. And so that notion and understanding remains true today. And so it's going to be very difficult for any uh, government in the region to say, oh, you know what? We're just going to say to the Americans, thank you so much for coming, uh, please pack up your bags and go. And this is what Iran has done. And this is what I, I want to keep coming back to, that this act of um, a revolution that Iran conducted in 79 had reparations within the country, within the region, and the geopolitics of the Middle East in terms of regional powers, but it also went beyond its borders all across the world because you cannot allow a mid-sized economy like Iran to gain independence in the fear that others may follow through. And that is why it became such a fearful uh, concept for the monarchies and for the despots who ruled across the Middle East. Because if this revolution of Iran spread to their shores, it would be the end of their rule. Very good, okay. So, um, so all of this, this chaos is happening with, with, uh, with 9-11. Uh, we all know this, we all know the story and we know that, um, the United States takes the opportunity to launch its war on terror, which focuses initially on, uh, on Afghanistan and then turns its attention to, to Iraq. And, uh, so Iran is in, is in the middle of all of this and presumably feeling, feeling very worried. Um, what, what, what is kind of happening in Iran in this period of, of history? What's, what's going on? What's the political leadership thinking? And, you know, the United States talks about this axis of evil in which it links up, I think it was Iraq and Iran and, and, and Syria or North Korea or something like that in North Korea in, in some moment. What's, What's going on in Iran? Because you've just survived a, an eight-year war. It must be feeling very nervous about everything that's happening in the world. All right. We're going to go through this really fast because 91 happens, the first Gulf War. The Americans come, they liberate Kuwait, they destroy the infrastructure of uh, Saddam Hussein, but they keep Saddam Hussein in power for another decade, as you said, until 2003, the second Gulf War, that finished off uh, Saddam Hussein for good uh, in that war. And that came, came after the 9-11 attacks. Now, at the time of 9-11, Iran was led by a reformist administration of Dr. Khatami, who talked actually in his first speech at the UN for the dialogue among civilizations, that we need to break this wall that is being erected in between our grand civilizations and we need to have a dialogue, we need to talk, we need to use diplomacy to resolve our issues. Khatami's government 
was really forward thinking. And when 9-11 happened, it was one of the first countries, Iran, that sent a message to the US of condolences in what has happened with 9-11. And in that letter, it said that Iran understands the impact of terrorism on its population. It understands the mourning of when uh, you know, these attacks are done on civilians. Because Iran was at the receiving end of many terrorist attacks since uh, 1979, for multiple reasons, which I don't need to get into right now. But when we are now zooming into 2001, Iran gives an olive branch to the U.S. and says, we can even assist you in, in, uh, in, your, in, in bringing to prosecution those who are responsible. Because, mind you, Al-Qaeda and Taliban were the sworn enemies of who? Of Iran. Because they saw Iran as a Shia country that is the infidels. <laughs> it was the Al-Qaeda and Taliban that massacred Iranian diplomatic uh, um, uh, personnel in Afghanistan uh, in just a year or two before the 9-11 uh, that almost brought Iran and Afghanistan to war. So Iran had its own interest in seeing the fall of the Taliban and the fall of Al-Qaeda because it believed that this type of ideology will only breed more division, will bring an sectarian conflict of magnitudes that are not necessary to get to. So Iran actually gave an olive branch. And in 2001, in October, when the United States decided to invade Afghanistan as a revenge of 9-11 and went into Afghanistan, it realized very quickly that it needs intelligence and coordination on the ground. And who was the opposition to Al-Qaeda and Taliban? Iranian allies in Afghanistan, the Northern Alliance, they were called. The Northern Alliance was an Iranian ally that under Iranian leadership was given the permission to cooperate at all levels with the Americans so that they can bring an end to the Taliban's rule and by extension, a safe haven they have been providing to Al-Qaeda. So in a sense, the success of the US in Afghanistan could not have been you know, paved without the cooperation of Iran with the US over its intervention in Afghanistan. These are the things that history somehow wants us to forget. But uh, Afghanistan, the victory of U.S. in Afghanistan initially, initially was with its alliance with Iran. Now, as we speak today, the U.S. is withdrawing from the Afghanistan. It's longest war it has fought and is packing their bags and they're leaving Afghanistan to its own devices and they haven't been able to secure that country. No today, no after uh, when they got in. And that, again, can be traced back to how they then developed or repaid Iran for its cooperation in Afghanistan. Do you know how they repaid Iran for their cooperation, Tony? No, no. President Bush goes and labels Iran as the axis of evil. Mm -hmm. After Iran has provided logistical uh, personnel its allies in Afghanistan to help the U.S. oust Taliban and Al-Qaeda, President Bush gets on the front of the U.N. and puts Iran in this box. Do you know what that did to Khatami and his reformist uh, political uh, thinking in Iran? It closed his hands. They said, look, you help the Americans and look at how they answer you. They put you on an axe of evil. Two years later, U.S. enters into, uh, into Iraq under the pretext of getting rid of weapons of mass destruction that we today know was on a false premise. There again, who do you think that helped the United States get rid of Saddam Hussein quicker than anybody else? In terms of real support to the American invasion, it was the opposition of Saddam Hussein who were exiled and lived where? In Iran. So again, you have 
United States entering Afghanistan, entering Iraq, getting rid of the two most immediate enemies neighboring Iran and replacing them by the allies of Iran. And that, by the end of 2003, created a havoc in Tel Aviv, in Riyadh, in other capitals of the Middle East. They had been pumping billions to make sure Iran remains weak. And you have the Americans coming and flipping these two countries and handing them over on a silver platter to the Iranians. So I have to thank the Americans for that. Okay, let's stop there because you know, <laughs> because we've been we've been talking for a, for a good period of time, um, and let's pick it up next time when you know post post second uh, the second Gulf War and and the development of the Iranian nuclear program, which is today the subject of such uh, contention in global politics. So thank Tony. you very much, Imad. And thank you to everyone who's, been, who's watched this video thus far, got to the end of this second episode, and uh, next week we'll come up with a, with a further instalment to find out what are the roots of violence in the Middle East. Thank you very much.